Hello and welcome back to the Shaky Sonnet Show. I am Too Tight Latrec, the drag laureate of the sanitarium, and we are here in the sanitarium at the bottom of the down staircase in the permanently sequestered remainder section of an unnamed local library, which may or may not have some lions couchant resting on the front steps, taking a good long rest because we are indeed halfway through the sonnets. Who Ray. We are at Sonnet 77, halfway through the 154 sonnets of Shakespeare in the 1609 quarto version, and hallelujah, we're going to end our season here and come back for the next half and hopefully finish it before I turn 7,000 years old. Today we're looking at Sonnet 77, and oddly, as so many people go on and on and on about Shakespeare's love of numbers and puzzles and games and such, I expected during my research that I would find a lot about the numerical position of this sonnet in the series, and or at least find some something somewhere about Sonnet 77 being Sonnet 77 in the middle of the, the series, but um, no. I found nothing. Don Patterson at one point discusses it as a halfway point, and he only half-heartedly performs some mathematical hijinks um, to guess at why the sonnet seems so out of place, and in the end it doesn't seem like he even convinces himself. My own theories are that um, this sonnet, which appears to be a sonnet giving the beloved a gift of a book, an empty book, um, that it's possibly a birthday gift, and birthdays disrupt everything. They are, gifts are given because of the day and not necessarily because of what's been happening, what, what's been happening in the relationship, but it's an odd sort of thing to do to include a birthday sonnet in a sonnet series, you can put anything anywhere, and so that doesn't seem very likely. Um, perhaps my second guess was that it's a reunion gift because the, they seem to have been separated, this couple, from sonnet 61 through 74, and in 75 and 76 they appear to be reunited, so perhaps this is a reunion gift, and that's what I'm going to go with here. Um, a way of saying I've written 76 sonnets all about what I think about you, and a little bit about what I think about me as an amazing genius poet. Um, here's an empty book, What Do You Think of Me, is my guess. Another unlikely possibility is that it's the narrator looking in the mirror and writing the sonnet to him or herself, but as I say, I don't actually believe that that's a likely situation. So let's look at it, see what's going on, and get into the final show of the season. Sonnet 77 Thy glass will show thee how thy beauties wear, thy dial how thy precious minutes waste. The vacant leaves thy mind's imprint will bear, and of this book this learning mayst thou taste. The wrinkles which thy glass will truly show of mouthed graves will give thee memory. Thou by thy dial's shady stealth mayst know time's thievish progress to eternity. Look what thy memory cannot contain, commit to these waste blanks, and thou shalt find those children nursed, delivered from thy brain, to take a new acquaintance of thy mind. These offices, so oft as thou wilt look, shall profit thee, and much enrich thy book. So, in the first quatrain, the narrator is obviously giving the beloved a blank book. He's giving a blank book. He's not gifting a blank book. And here I will go off on a, on a tiny digression um, that is still language-based, but he is giving the beloved a book, not gifting a beloved a book, because gift is a noun, and there is no such noun as gifting 
it's giving. It's a perfectly good verb that we should use, and, and this gifting word has annoyed me so much that I have decided to look it up. Yes, that's how much it's annoyed me. I decided to look up to see if there, what the origins of this word might be, and so I've gone to Grammar Girl, which is a pseudonym for a woman named Mignon Fogarty of Quick and Dirty Dip, Quick and Dirty Tips dot com, um, and I will link the article below. And yes, okay, I found out that the word is in fact 400 years old, but the Oxford English Dictionary identifies it as chiefly used by the Scottish. So, if you're Scottish, I could forgive you, maybe. Probably not, but maybe I will. But even then, its use was mostly um, gifting was related to the gift tax in Scotland, and gifting was a way of cementing patronage relationships, so it was specifically related to the gift tax, and it was, it was uh, monetarily based. It wasn't just giving someone something for their birthday or for um, Valentine's Day or simply for giving a friend something because you like your friend and you saw it and you thought, oh, this would be good for my friend. I will give them something that I think that they will like. Grammar Girl identifies uh, a 1995 Seinfeld episode as the source of this nefarious word. There is an episode where Elaine gives one of her friends a label maker, and then that friend gives the label maker to Jerry Seinfeld, and then Jerry shows it to Elaine, and Elaine says, where'd you get it? And he names the friend who gave it to him. Indeed, it was the friend that Elaine gave it to in the first place. And she says, he is a regifter. And ha ha ha, hilarity ensues. But Grammar Girl thinks that the word gifting became a back formation of regifter um, from that Seinfeld episode. To, so I have something to say to whoever or whomever that Seinfeld writer was um, of that particular episode and coined the term regifter. I say to you, using Shakespeare's words. Away, you starveling, you elf skin, you dried neat's tongue, bull's pizzle, you stockfish. Methinks thou art a general offense, and that every man should beat thee for saying gifting, or creating the word gifting. So now I understand that Shakespeare, in fact, originated or invented many words too, so I understand the impulse. I don't scorn the impulse, but we already have a perfectly functional word, and that word is giving, not gifting. We don't need a new one. Gift is a noun. If I read a book, I'm not booking. If I, if I take a drink, I'm not martining. And if I'm doing drag, I'm not dragging, although some may disagree with that. So, quatrain one, sonnet 77. The narrator is giving a book to the beloved. At the end of the first sentence, the word is, Thy glass will show thee how thy beauties wear, W-E-A-R. In the 1609 quarto, uh, the word appeared as word, W-E-R-E, -E, and either of those will work in my estimation. Thy glass will show thee how thy beauties wear, you know, how you are wearing your youth or your beauty or your old age, or thy glass will show thee how thy beauties were, past tense. Look at your face and you'll see it's not all that it used to be 10 or 20 or 5,000 years ago. Um, the dial, thy dial, thy precious minutes waste, dial of a clock or a sundial. The vacant leaves thy mind's imprint will bear, and of this book this learning thou mayst taste. So I'm giving you this book so that you can write down your thoughts for a future time. And then in the second quatrain, the wrinkles of which thy glass will truly show. Well now of course we're in Shakespeare, so wherever there's a, a glass or a mirror, there's going to be a wrinkle or two. Um, 
the wrinkles which thy glass will truly show of mouthed graves, and this is wonderful, of mouthed graves will give thee memory. Thou by thy dial shady stealth mayst know time's thievish progress to eternity. This idea of a grave as an all-devouring mouth that will eat up your life once it's over, um, and time's thievish, thievish progress to eternity is just a wonderful, wonderful image. And the the dial's shady stealth, as if it's a sundial, and the shade, the the, the kind of creeps along at its steady pace, to coin a term. Um, so we get this shadow of the sun pressing the time forward as we go from cradle to grave, time's thievish progress to eternity. And this image of uh, an all-consuming mouth, the grave as an all-consuming mouth, also appears in a couple of other places in Shakespeare I found out while I was doing my research, and I thought I would just note them. There is Venus and Adonis, line 757, what is thy body but a swallowing grave? And in King John, act two, scene one, line 354, through a couple of other lines, and I will read that for you. Oh, now doth death line his dead chops with steel. The swords of soldiers are his teeth, his fangs, and now he feasts, mousing the flesh of men in undetermined differences of kings. How's that for a for an all-devouring mouth of, of a grave? So, Quatrain 2. Here's a book. Write in it because it will keep your memories, even if you can't because you're growing old and forgetful. And then we get to, to the third quatrain, and we get this idea of words as children. Look what thy memory cannot contain. Commit to these waste blanks, the, the blank pages. And thou shalt find those children, the words that you put down, those children nursed, delivered from thy brain, to take a new acquaintance of thy mind. So you can write down these words. They will be fresh as a newborn babe, so that when you come back to them in your older age, you will be able to see what they have wrought or you can see where you were at this particular time and in that way sort of preserve it. And here we have this idea of words as children, which is a far cry from the first 17 sonnets where the narrator was urging the beloved to procreate before he was even, he, it does seem to be in the first 17 sonnets, before he was even really the beloved. Um, so now, instead of actual children, we have words as children. And then we end with the couplet, which I find actually rather boring. Um, these offices, or these duties that are carried out, these offices, so oft as thou wilt look, shall profit thee, and much enrich thy book. So write it down, read it back, thank me later. That's the sonnet as a whole. It's not a stellar sonnet by any means. And here it is smack dab in the middle of the series, but um, there is an interesting take on it by one scholar, which I will read to you. As of right now, there is no indication of whether the narrator or the beloved are male or female. No gender identified here. Dramatically, it could it could be just about anyone. It could. It seems like it could be mostly an older person to a younger person, maybe Polonius to Laertes or something like that. But it could also be from a younger person to another younger person as a gift, a love gift of some sort, because young people understand or are able to see what it looks like to grow old, and they understand that if they're lucky, they will also grow old. So it could work in any number of dramatic possibilities. Narratively, it seems sort of like, okay, I've written these last 76 sonnets um, saying what I think about you and also what I think about what a genius I am as a poet. Here's an empty book. Your turn. You tell me what you think. One of my favorite summaries of this sonnet is by an Irish scholar named Edward Dowden. And this 
Edward Dowden was such a well-known Irish scholar that James Joyce included him as a character in the library chapter of Ulysses, and he used some of the concepts that Edward Dowden had or the ideas that he had about Shakespeare in that chapter, the library chapter in uh, Ulysses. So Dowden, thanks to my man, Hyder Edward Rollins, I have exactly what Dowden said. Hyder Edward Rollins says that Dowden, in, in an edition of the sonnets from 1881, conjectures Shakespeare, who had perhaps begun a new manuscript book with sonnet 75, and who, as I suppose, apologized for the monotony of his verses in 76, here ceased to write, here meaning sonnet 77. Knowing that his friend was favoring a rival, ooh, and invited his friend to fill up the blank pages himself. Beauty, time, and verse formed the theme of many of Shakespeare's sonnets. Now that he will write no more, he commends his friend to his glass, where he may discover the truth about his beauty, and to the dial, where he may learn the progress of time, and to this book, the book that, Shakespeare, that the narrator gives the beloved, which he himself, not Shakespeare, must fill. So that's Dowden's take on Sonnet 77, and I love that take because it shows another reader who is contemplating the sonnets as a consecutive series in the way in the series that they are that they appear. Whether it's accurate or not, I don't really care, but it shows to me that there is another active, curious mind willing to embark upon a project of invention to come to some sort of possibly fuller understanding of the sonnets in this particular arrangement. And it makes me feel slightly less crazy, Dr. Frankensonnet, as I might otherwise feel if I were the only one who were looking at it as a continuing sequence. And that, my friends, marks the halfway point of the 154 sonnet sequence. And all I have to say is, whew, I could probably say more, but my girdle's getting a little tight. So according to Edmondson and Wells, this group that we have just done in this season, Sonnet 61 to 77, were thought to have been composed earlier than the Sonnets 1 through 60 that we looked at. Um, the next set of Sonnets, Sonnet 78 to 86 are thought to have been originally composed much later than these. And all I know about 78 through 86, as Dowden sort of hinted at, these sonnets are known as the rival poet sonnets. So I think we can expect some drama come next season. But we'll take a breather here. Enjoy the holidays, and we'll all be well-rested to see what happens next. Until we meet again, have a lovely bunch of holidays, whatever holidays you celebrate, and enjoy the wonders that abound in your world. And remember to always pay attention. Until we meet again, I am Tutelachek. Mwah, 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 mwah.